Cora TV. The world is thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Elliot Gerson, and I am absolutely delighted on behalf of our sponsor for this track, Allstate, to introduce uh, our next speaker. Uh, Sam Harris is the author of, of two best-selling books, uh, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation. Uh, he has uh, appeared on countless uh, uh, television shows, he's written in many publications, and indeed one could almost say that he was the first to launch a recent and very substantial intellectual uh, uh, and literary uh, trend in the United States carrying over into Europe, uh, where people speak very seriously about faith and the lack of faith. Uh, his, uh, he's a graduate in philosophy from Stanford. He's studied uh, religion extensively over many, many years. He's also one of, I probably because of the best-selling status of his books and the demand for him as a speaker, he is very slow in getting his doctorate in neuroscience, but he assures me he will still do that someday. Uh, one thing, though, I think that can safely be said about Sam uh, in terms of his his intellectual impact and his contribution to the free exchange of ideas. While I think it's probably still safe to say that it will be a very, very long time before a self-proclaimed atheist could be elected to public office in this country, unlike most countries in Western Europe, I think since Sam's pioneering book, and I think this is something that has to be applauded by everyone who believes in free speech and tolerance, that people who are not of faith at least have the comfort in social settings to acknowledge their lack of faith in a way that really has not been the case in, in much of American cultural and social tradition. Uh, Sam indicates that he himself didn't use the word atheist of his own opinions until after uh, his book but he again has, has generated, uh, uh, I think, enormous interest, controversy, uh, and debate. And I think that's healthy for people of faith as well as people without faith. I'm very pleased to introduce Sam Harris. How come you're all not at um, Walter Isaacson's talk on Einstein? Even I want to be at Walter's talk on Einstein. Um, well, you've all made a terrible mistake. I'm going to adjust this here. Well, I often, can you all hear me okay? I often begin any talk, talk on this subject with an apology because I think I am I'm destined to say, to say some very derogatory things about religion, and given that we live in a country where 90% of people believe in a biblical God, I think I'm destined to offend some of you here. Uh, I want to assure you that's not the point. It's not the point of my being here. It's not the point of my writing my books. I'm not being deliberately provocative. I'm simply extremely worried about the role that religion is playing in our world. Uh, I think religion is the most divisive and dangerous ideology that we have ever produced. Uh, and what's more, it's the only ideology that is systematically protected from criticism, both from within and without. Uh, it, it remains taboo. I mean, you, you, can, you can criticize someone's beliefs about, on, really on any subject, but it remains taboo to criticize their beliefs about God. And I think we're paying an extraordinary price for maintaining this taboo. So I'm going to break this taboo rather enthusiastically over the next hour, uh, and I'll get, I will leave some time for questions, and I'm, I'm happy to take your, your criticism. Uh, I also want to, to point out up front, there's nothing that I'm about to say that should be construed as a denial of the possibilities of spiritual experience, and indeed of the, the importance of spiritual experience, and that's a subject I'll, I'll come back to at the end. I mean, here's, here's my basic concern. 
our ability to cause ourselves harm is now spreading with 21st century efficiency. And yet we are still, to a remarkable degree, drawing our vision of how to live in this world from ancient literature. Th this marriage of, of modern technology, destructive technology, and Iron Age philosophy is a bad one for reasons that I think nobody should have to specify, much less argue for. And yet arguing for them has, has taken up most of my time since September 11, 2001. That day that, that 19 pious men showed our pious nation just how socially beneficial religious certainty can be. Now, as someone who has spent a few years publicly criticizing religion, I've become quite familiar with how people rise to the defense of God. As it turns out, there are not a hundred ways of doing this. There appear to be just three. Either a person argues that a specific religion is true, or he argues that religion is useful, and indeed so useful that it might be necessary. Or he argues that, that atheism is essentially another religion, dogmatic, intolerant, uh, or otherwise worthy of contempt. And I, I want to I differentiate these three strands of argument because they're, they regularly run together and any conversation between a believer and non-believers is, is liable to fall into one of these ruts. Let's, let's begin with the specific claim that a, a given religion is true. There are two problems with arguing this. The first is that, as Bertrand Russell pointed out over a century ago, they can't all be true. I mean, given the sheer diversity of, of religions on offer, even if we knew that one of them was absolutely true, I mean, even if we knew this was, this was God's multiple choice exam, is it A, Judaism, B, Christianity, C, Islam, even if we knew we were in this situation, Every believer should expect to wind up in hell purely as a matter of probability. It, it, it seems to me this, this should give religious people pause when they, before they espouse their religious certainties. It never does, but it should. The second problem with arguing for the truth of religion is that the evidence for our religious doctrines is either terrible or non-existent. And this subsumes all claims about the existence of a personal God, the divine origin of certain books, the virgin birth of certain people, uh, the veracity of ancient miracles, all of it. Consider Christianity. The entire doctrine is predicated on the idea that the, the gospel account of the miracles of Jesus is true. This is, this is why people believe Jesus was the Son of God, divine, etc. This textual claim, this textual claim is problematic because everyone acknowledges that the Gospels followed Jesus' ministry by decades, and there, there's no extra biblical account of his miracles. But, but the, the truth is quite a bit worse than that. The, the truth is, even if we had multiple contemporaneous eyewitness accounts of the miracles of Jesus, this still would not provide sufficient basis to believe that these events actually occurred. Well, why not? Well, the problem is that first-hand reports of miracles are quite common, even in the 21st century. Um, I have met literally, literally hundreds at this point of Western-educated men and women who think that their favorite Hindu or Buddhist guru has magic powers. It, all, the powers ascribed to these gurus are every bit as outlandish as those ascribed to Jesus. Uh, now, I, I actually remain open to evidence of such powers, but the, the, the fact is that people who tell these stories desperately want to believe them. All, to my knowledge, lack the kind of corroborating evidence we should require before believing that nature's laws have been abrogated in this way. And, and people who, tr who believe these stories show an uncanny reluctance to look for non-miraculous causes. But it remains a fact that yogis and mystics uh, are said to be walking on water and raising the dead and flying without the aid of technology, uh, materializing objects, reading minds, foretelling the future, R right now. In fact, all of these powers have been ascribed to Satya Sai Baba, the, the South Indian guru, by an uncountable number of eyewitnesses. Now, he even claims to have been born of a virgin, which is not all that uncommon a claim in, his, in the history of religion or in history generally, Genghis Khan supposedly was born of a virgin, as was, was Alexander, 
Apparently, parthenogenesis doesn't guarantee that you're going to turn the other cheek. Uh, but Satya Sai Baba is not a fringe figure. He's not the David Koresh of Hinduism. His followers threw a birthday party for him recently, and a million people showed up. So there are, there are vast numbers of people who believe he is a living God. You can even watch his miracles on YouTube. Prepare to be underwhelmed. Uh, I mean, it's true that he has an afro of sufficient diameter as to suggest a total detachment from the opinions of his fellow human beings, but I'm not sure this is reason enough to worship him. Uh, in any case, so consider, as though for the first time, the foundational claim of Christianity. The claim is this, that miracle stories of a sort that today surround a person like Satya Sai Baba become especially compelling when you set them in the pre-scientific religious context of the first century Roman Empire, decades after their supposed occurrence. We have Satya Sai Baba's miracle stories attested to by thousands upon thousands of living eyewitnesses, and they don't even merit an hour on the Discovery Channel. But you place a few miracle stories in some ancient books, and half the people on this earth think it a legitimate project to organize their lives around them. Does anyone else see a problem with that? <laughs> Speaking more generally, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are founded on the claim that the Bible and the Quran were dictated by the creator of the universe. I mean, there, is a, there is a creator, there is a personal God, and he occasionally writes books. He doesn't, he doesn't code software, he doesn't produce films. Mel Gibson's claim to have been toiling all the while under the influence of the Holy Spirit, I think is probably an exception here. Uh, but in any case, God is principally an author of books. And this idea has achieved credibility because the, the contents of these books are deemed to be so profound that they could not possibly have been produced by the human mind. Please consider how implausible this is. Consider how differently we treat scientific texts and discoveries. In the year 1665, it was beginning in the summer of 1665, Isaac Newton went into isolation to dodge the outbreak of plague that was incidentally laying waste to the pious men and women of England. Uh, and when he, when he had emerged from his solitude, he had invented the integral and differential calculus he had discovered the laws of universal gravitation and motion. He had set the field of optics on its foundation. Now, many scientists think this is the most awe-inspiring display of human intelligence in the history of human intelligence. And yet no one is tempted to ascribe this to divine agency. We know that th th these accomplishments were, were affected by a mortal, and a, and a very unpleasant mortal at that. And yet literally billions of us deem the contents of the Bible and the Quran so profound as to rule out the possibility of, of terrestrial authorship. Now, given the depth and breadth of human achievement, I think this is almost a miracle in its own right. It seems to me a miraculous misappropriation of awe. It, it took two centuries of continuous human ingenuity on the, part of, on, on the part of some of the smartest people who have ever lived to significantly improve upon Newton's achievement. How difficult would it be to improve the Bible? I mean, anyone in this tent could improve this, uh, this supposedly inerrant text scientifically, historically, ethically, spiritually in a matter of moments. I mean, consider the possibility of improving the Ten Commandments. I mean, th this may seem to be setting the bar kind of high because these are, this is the only part of the Bible, the only text, that, the, that God felt the need to physically write himself and in stone. Consider the second commandment, thou shalt not erect any graven images. Is this really the second most important thing <laughs> upon which to admonish all future generations of human beings? I mean, is, this, is this as good as it gets ethically and spiritually? You remember the Muslims who rioted by the hundreds of thousands over cartoons. 
What got them so riled up? Well, this is it, the second commandment. Now, was all that pious mayhem, the burning of embassies, the killing of nuns, was all of that some kind of great flowering of, of spiritual and ethical intelligence? Or was it egregious medieval stupidity? Well, come to think of it, it was egregious medieval stupidity. <laughs> The truth is that almost any precept we would put in place of the second commandment would improve the wisdom of the Bible. How about don't mistreat children? How about don't pretend to know things you do not know? Or what about just try not to deep fry all of your food? <laughs> could, could we live with the resulting proliferation of graven images. I think we would manage somehow. <laughs> so I submit to you that there is not a person on this earth who has good reason to believe that the Bible and the Quran are the product of omniscient intelligence. And yet billions of people claim to know that they're the word of God. In fact, 78% of the American population claims to know that the Bible is the word of God. 70% of college graduates believe that the Bible is the word of God. So let's leave aside questions of, of religion's truth for a moment. The second way of arguing in defense of God is to argue that religion is useful, and so useful that it may, in fact, be necessary. Now this, this line of argument is also problematic for a few reasons. The first is that it really is a total non sequitur. I mean, this is not, even, even if religious belief was exquisitely useful, I don't doubt there are circumstances in which it is in fact useful, but even if it were useful across the board, this would not give us reason to believe that a personal God exists or that any one of our books are his word. I mean, the fact that certain ideas are useful or motivating, or, or give people meaning in their lives. I mean, the fact that, that the idea that, that uh, God has a plan for me, or every, everything happens for a reason, the fact that such ideas are consoling does not offer the slightest reason to believe that they are true. And in fact, ironically, they, even if we had good scientific reasons to believe that these ideas were true, their power to console us wouldn't even offer an additional reason to believe that they're true. I mean, even if, the, even if the cosmologists and the physicists came forward suddenly and said, you know, sorry for the misunderstanding, guys, but it seems there is a God and he, he has a plan for you. The fact that so many of us would, would, would find this consoling would give us further reason to be skeptical in scientific terms. This is why we have phrases like wishful thinking and self-delusion and self-deception. This is why scientists do double-blind controlled studies wherever possible. This is why they submit their data for peer review. If we have conquered any ground in, in, in our career of rationality, it is on this point. There is a profound difference between having, between having good reasons for believing something and simply wanting to believe it. Now, of course, there are other reasons to doubt the usefulness of religion. And many of these are enunciated on a daily basis by bomb blasts. I mean, how, how useful is it that millions of Muslims believe in the metaphysics of martyrdom? How useful is it that, that the Sunni and the Shia in Iraq have such heartfelt religious differences? How useful is it that so many Jewish settlers think that the creator of the universe promised them a patch of desert on the Mediterranean? How useful has, has Christianity's anxiety about sex been these last 70 generations? Now, th those who conflate usefulness and truth in defense of religion generally argue that, that religion provides the most reliable foundation for morality. Now, again, before we even, we're even tempted to evaluate this claim, please notice that it is a non sequitur. It is not, even if, even if religion made people moral, this would not provide evidence for the existence of God or that Jesus is his son or any specific doctrinal proposition to which people are attached. Every religion could function like a placebo. They could, they could be 
extremely useful, and entirely barren of content. But let's talk for a moment about the supposed link between morality and, and religion. It seems to me that religion gives people bad reasons to be good, where good reasons are actually available. I mean, ask yourself, which is more moral? Helping the poor, feeding the hungry, defending the weak, out of a mere concern for their well-being, or doing so because you think the creator of the universe wants you to do it? The truth is, people do not need to be threatened with damnation to love their children, to love their friends, to want to collaborate with strangers, or indeed to recognize that helping strangers can be one of their gr the greatest sources of happiness. And what kind of morality is it that is entirely predicated on a self-interested desire to escape damnation? This seems to bypass the very core of what we mean by morality, which is an actual concern for the welfare of other human beings. Clearly, it is possible to teach our children to form such a concern and to grow in empathy and compassion without lying to ourselves or to them about the nature of the universe, without pretending to know things we do not know. You can teach your children the golden rule as an utterly wise ethical precept without pretending to know that Jesus was born of a virgin. It's also worth observing that the most atheistic societies on the planet, like Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands, are in many respects the most moral. They, they have rates of violent crime that, that are far lower than our own in the US. Uh, and they're more generous, both within their own population and in the developing world on a per capita basis. In Sweden, which opposed the war in Iraq, has nevertheless admitted more Iraqi refugees uh, into its borders than any country, and many more than the US has. So if you're looking for a, a state model of Christian charity, the most atheistic societies at this moment fit it better than the most Christian societies do. But what about this notion that we get our morality out of Scripture? Well, clearly we don't get our most basic moral impulses out of Scripture, because these can be seen emerging very early. I mean, toddlers 18 months old will, will spontaneously try to comfort somebody who looks upset. And a person clearly doesn't learn that cruelty is wrong by re reading the Bible or the Quran, because if you don't already know that going in, you're just going to be confronted with, with endless celebrations of cruelty in these texts. I mean, these, these books are, are bursting with celebrations of cruelty, both human and divine. The, the God of the Bible hates sodomy and will kill you for it, but he rather enjoys the occasional human sacrifice. <laughs> but I think at the very least we can, we can say he doesn't quite have his priorities straight. In the Old Testament, we witness the most immoral behavior imaginable. Genocide, ethnic cleansing, sexual slavery, the murder of children, kidnapping, all of it not only permitted by God, but mandated by God. And if you doubt this, take another look at books like Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and 2 Samuel and Numbers and first and second kings, and Zechariah. I mean, these books, on these bo in these books, the, the most unethical behavior is celebrated. If, 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 if these events occurred in our own time, half the prophets and kings of Israel would be shackled and brought to the Hague for crimes against humanity, including Moses for slaughtering the Midianites, including Joshua for slaughtering the Amalekites, including Elijah for slaughtering the, pro the prophets of Baal. I mean, these men, by, by our standards today, they were utter psychopaths. As was Abraham for, as Christopher Hitchens recently put it, for taking such a long and gloomy walk with his son Isaac. <laughs> now you might wonder, well, what about the Ten Commandments? What about thou shalt not murder? Well, the problem is the Ten Commandments simply give us more bad reasons to kill people. I mean, what are you supposed to do when your best friend breaks the Sabbath or erects a graven image or takes the Lord's name in vain? 
you're supposed to kill him. And if you're unwilling to kill him, your neighbors are supposed to kill you. Is this really the best book we have on morality? Is it even a good book? Now, happily, most Christians and Jews now disregard the morality on offer in the Old Testament. And they rationalize the barbarity we find there by saying, oh, this was appropriate to the time, it was appropriate to the ancient world. The idea being that the Canaanites were so ill-behaved that just getting together a short list of reasons to kill your neighbor and sticking to it was a great improvement over the, the general barbarity of the time. No, it wasn't. It was, it was within the moral compass of human beings then to recognize that killing somebody for adultery was evil. The Buddha managed it. Mahavira, the Jain patriarch, managed it. Numerous Greek philosophers managed it. So, so Jews and Christians are simply lying to themselves when they talk about the impediments to morality that prevailed in the fifth century BC. And, and the other thing to notice is that rationalizing the barbarism we find in the Old Testament merely renders it irrelevant. It doesn't render these books morally wise. I mean, it is faint praise indeed if the best that can be said of much of scripture is that it can now be safely ignored. Now, and despite what, what Christians say on the subject, the New Testament isn't so good as to make the Bible a reliable basis of morality. In fact, much of the book is an embarrassment to anyone who would say it is a moral book, much less a perfectly moral book. And nowhere is this clearer than on the question of slavery. And the truth is, the Bible in its totality, Old Testament, New Testament, support slavery. If we recognize anything, if we, if, if we converge on any point in ethical terms now, it's that slavery is evil. Nowhere in the Bible is this evil recognized, much less repudiated. The slaveholders of the South were on the winning side of a theological argument. They knew it. They never stopped talking about it. The best God does in, in the Old Testament is to admonish us not to beat our slaves so badly that we injure their eyes or their teeth. Or, or not to beat them so badly with a rod that they die on the spot. If they die after a day or two, no problem. I think it should go without saying that this is not the kind of moral insight that got rid of slavery in the United States. Or consider the treatment of women. I mean, for millennia, the great theologians and, and prophets of our religions have set to work on the, the riddle of womanhood. And the result in various times and places has been widow burning and honor killing and genital mutilation, a cultic obsession with virginity, uh, just other forms of, of physical and psychological abuse so kaleidoscopic in variety as to scarcely admit of being summarized. Now, I, I have no doubt that much of this sexist evil predates religion and can be ascribed to our biology, but there's no question that religion promulgates and renders sacrosanct attitudes toward women that would be unseemly in a brachiating ape. Now, while man was made in the image of God, woman was made in the image of man, according to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Her, her humanity, therefore, is derivative. It's erzatz. The Old Testament values the life of a woman at one half to two thirds that of a man. The Quran says that the testimony of two women is required to offset the testimony of one man. And every woman is, is deserving of one half her brother's share of inheritance. But the biblical God has made it perfectly clear that women are expected to live in, in absolute subjugation to their fathers until the moment they are pressed into connubial service to their husbands. And the New Testament offers no relief. I mean, St. Paul put it in his letter to the Ephesians, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their husbands in all things. The, the Quran delivers the same message. And on most translations, argue, says that, that uh, disobedient wives should be whipped or scourged or beaten. 
The 11th century sage, Al-Ghazali, perhaps the most influential Muslim since Muhammad, described a woman's duties this way. She should stay at home and get on with her spinning. She should not go out often. She must not be well informed, nor must she be communicative with her neighbors and only visit them when absolutely necessary. She should take care of her husband and respect him in his presence and in his absence and seek to satisfy him in everything. She must not leave the house without his permission and if given his permission, she must leave surreptitiously. She should put on old clothes and take the deserted streets and alleys, avoid markets, make sure that a stranger does not hear her voice or recognize her. She must not speak to a friend of her husband's even in need. Her sole worry should be her virtue, her home as well as her prayers and her fast. If a friend of her husband calls when the latter is absent, she must not open the door nor reply to him in order to safeguard her and her husband's honor. She should accept what her husband gives her as sufficient sexual needs at any moment. She should be clean and ready to satisfy her husband's sexual needs at any moment. Now recall the blissful lives of women in Afghanistan under the Taliban, or think about the, the millions of women who even now are forced to wear the veil under Islam, or who are, who, who are forced into these, these forced marriages with men they have never met, and you will realize that th these kinds of religious opinions have consequences. The net effect of religion, especially in, in the Abrahamic tradition, has been to demonize female sexuality and portray women as, as morally and intellectually inferior to men. I mean, every woman, it is, it is imagined, holds the honor of the men in her lives for ransom and is liable to tarnish it with a glance or, or destroy it outright through sexual indiscretion. In this, in this context, rape is actually a crime that one man con commits against another man. It's, it, the woman is only shame's vehicle and often culpably acquiescent, being all blandishments and guile and winking treachery. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 22, God says that if a woman doesn't scream loudly enough while being raped, she should be stoned to death as an accessory to her own defilement. And there's no escaping the view in the, in the Bible and the Quran that women have been put on earth to serve men, to keep their homes in order, and to be incubators of sons. So I think this is a fact that, that really cannot be disputed. If we ever achieve a global civilization that, that truly values and honors the, the rights and capabilities of women, it will not be because we paid more attention to our holy books. So to summarize, the basic claim that we get our morality from religion is clearly false. The claim that we're the only species that has moral impulses is also false. I mean, we, we, clearly, our ability, our ability to cooperate with one another can be explained in evolutionary terms. I mean, chimpanzees with whom we share 99% of our DNA find one another's emotional lives contagious, just as we do. They're motivated to reconcile after disputes, to comfort one another. Chimpanzees have even died trying to save other chimpanzees from drowning. They react negatively to situations that they perceive as unfair, like the unequal distribution of food. Given how gregarious all primates are, it is not a surprise that evolution would have selected for a variety of ethical concerns and, and social instincts. Now, religious people, I think, are right to believe that our morality isn't merely a product of culture. I mean, it, it, it is deeply hardwired in us. And it, it clearly is, is massively empowered by our ability to speak and to write. I mean, language gives us the capacity to extend our moral horizons beyond our mere family and kin and even beyond our species. But it's also, it should be pointed out, that language also empowers our hatred and stupidity to a remarkable degree. And we are the only species, to my knowledge, that can forsake life-saving medical research demonize homosexuals or fly planes into buildings because of what we tell one another about God. The, fa the fact is, the basic fact is, on this point of morality, is that we decide what is good in our good books. I mean, we come to the Bible and we see that 
It says in Leviticus, if a woman is not a virgin on her wedding night, you're supposed to stone her to death on her father's doorstep. We choose to reject this pearl of ancient wisdom. And then we choose to emphasize something like the golden rule. So that the guarantor of our morality is in our brains, not in our books. So I've spoken about the, the problems in arguing that religion is true and in arguing that religion is useful. The last way of defending God is to argue that atheism is dogmatic, intolerant, or otherwise worthy of, of uh, reproach. Now, as I pointed out in, in my second book, Letter to a Christian Nation, atheism is really a term we do not need. I mean, it, in the same way that we don't have a word for someone who's not an astrologer. You know, no, <laughs> You know, we don't have websites for non-astrologers. There are no groups for non-astrologers. Nobody wakes up in the morning feeling the need to remind himself that he's not an astrologer. I mean, the irony is that atheism is completely without content. It is not a philosophical position. And all religious people are atheists with respect to everyone else's religion. I mean, we're all atheists with respect to the thousands of dead gods who lie in that mass grave we call mythology. I mean, think of Thor and Isis and Zeus. You know, they, they, these were once gods in good standing among our ancestors. Everyone now rejects them. Well, actually, not everyone. I occasionally get hate mail from people who do believe in Zeus, but that's a, another story. Um, but the, more importantly, every Christian rejects the claims of Islam, just as I do. You know, Muslims claim that they have the perfect word of the creator of the universe. Why do they believe this? Because it says so in the book. Sorry, not good enough. So, so th this term atheism really is misleading. We're talking about specific truth claims and their evidence, or lack thereof. Now, what about the charge that atheism is dogmatic? Let's get this straight. Jews, Christians, and Muslims claim that their holy books are so profound, so prescient of humanity's needs, that they could have only been written by an omniscient being. An atheist is simply a person who has entertained this claim, read the books, and found the claim to be ridiculous. This is not dogmatism. There's nothing that an atheist needs to believe on insufficient evidence in order to reject the biblical God. What dogma have we all embraced to not take Apollo and Zeus into account as we go about our day? What, would it be dogmatic to doubt that the Iliad or the Odyssey was dictated by the creator of the universe? The atheist is simply saying, as Carl Sagan did, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If ever there were an antidote to dogmatism, this is it. There, there's a related claim that atheists and scientists generally are arrogant. Now, I, this is rather ironic. The, the truth is, is that when scientists don't know something, like why the universe came into being or how the first self-replicating molecules formed on Earth, they tend to admit it. Pretending to know things you do not know is a profound liability in science. You get punished for this rather quickly. But pretending to know things you do not know is the lifeblood of faith-based religion. Any, uh, this is really one of the profound ironies of religious discourse in the, the frequency with, with which you can hear religious people praise themselves for their humility <laughs> while tacitly claiming to know things about cosmology and physics and chemistry and paleontology that no scientist knows. I mean, any, any person who, who dignifies Genesis as an account of creation or as, even as, as informative is essentially saying to someone like Stephen Hawking, Stephen, you're a smart guy, and, and uh, you know, I see you got a lot, a lot of equations over there, but you don't know enough about cosmology. You know, it says here that, that, that 
that God did this in six days and then rested on the seventh, and I don't see how you've really grappled with the, the nuances of the biblical account. Uh, th this would be amusing if it were not having such a disastrous effect upon our public policy. It, it, it is impeding medical research and the teaching of science in this country. 30% of te biology teachers in the United States at the high school level don't even mention evolution because of the, the, ha to, because of the hassle occasioned by the, just the, the religious hysteria that it provokes in their students and their students' parents. You all remember the, the recent presidential debate where three Republican candidates for the, the presidency solemnly raised their hands to testify that they don't believe in evolution. And there was no, there was no follow-up question. I mean, this is embarrassing. And it seems like every few months, the opinion page of the New York Times publishes another defense of this kind of ignorance. There's no question that this is eroding our stature in the eyes of the rest of the developed world. It, it's not arrogant or dogmatic to point this out. I mean, it seems to me that our intellectual honesty lives or dies in this trench. Now, it's, it's co also commonly imagined that atheists think there is nothing beyond human life and human understanding. The truth is that atheists are, are free to admit that there's much about the universe we don't understand. I mean, it is obvious we don't understand the universe. But it is even more obvious that neither the Bible nor the Quran reflects our best understanding of it. There could be life on other planets, complex life, technical, technically uh, accomplished civilizations. I mean, just imagine a civilization a million years old as opposed to a few thousand. Atheists are free to imagine this possibility. They're also free to admit that if such brilliant extraterrestrials exist, the Bible and the Quran are going to be even less impressive to them than they are to human atheists. <laughs> it's often imagined that atheists are in principle closed to spiritual experience. But the truth is that athe there's nothing that prevents an atheist from experiencing self-transcending love or ecstasy or rapture or awe. In fact, there's nothing that prevents an atheist from going into a cave for a year or a decade and, and practicing meditation like a proper mystic. What atheists don't tend to do is make unjustified and unjustifiable, unjustifiable claims about the cosmos on the basis of those experiences. Now, there's no question that disciplines like meditation and prayer can have a profound effect upon the human mind. But do the positive experiences of, say, Christian mystics over the ages suggest that Jesus is the sole savior of humanity? Not even remotely, because, because Christians have been having these experiences, but so have Buddhists and Muslims and even atheists. So, so there's a deeper reality here, and it makes a mockery of religious denominations. The fact is that whenever human beings make an honest effort to get at the truth, they reliably transcend the accidents of their, of their birth and upbringing. I mean, just as it, it would be absurd to speak about Christian physics, though the Christians invented physics, and it would be absurd to speak about Muslim algebra, though the Muslims invented algebra, it will one day be absurd to speak about Christian or Muslim ethics or spirituality. Whatever is true about our circumstance in ethical and spiritual, tr in ethical and spiritual terms is discoverable now and can be articulated without offending all that we've come to understand about the nature of the universe. And certainly without making divisive claims about the unique sanctity of any book or, or pegging these most beautiful features of our lives to rumors of ancient miracles. Finally, there's, there's this notion that atheism is responsible for the greatest crimes in the 20th century. Now, this is actually, it's quite amazing to me. This is the most frequent objection I come across, so I think I should deal with it briefly. Um, it is amazing how many people think that the crimes of Hitler and Pol Pot and Mao were the result of atheism. 
The truth is, this is a total misconstrual of what went on in those societies and, and of the psychological and social forces that allow people to follow their dear leader over the brink. I mean, the problem with fascism and communism was not that they were too critical of religion. The problem is they're too much like religions. I mean, these are, these are utterly dogmatic systems of, of thought. I, mean, I recently had a, a debate with Rick Warren in the, in the pages of Newsweek. And he suggested that, that North Korea was a model atheist society and that any atheist with the courage of his convictions should want to move there. The truth is, North Korea is organized exactly like a faith-based cult, centered on the worship of, uh, worship of Kim Jong-il. The North Koreans apparently believe that the shipments of food aid that they receive from us to keep them from starving to death are actually devotional offerings to Kim Jong-il. Is too little faith really the problem with North Korea? Is, is, is too much skeptical inquiry what is wrong here? Yes, Auschwitz, the Gulag, and the Killing Fields are not the product of atheism. They are pr they're the product of other dogmas run amok, nationalism, political dogma. Hitler did not engineer a genocide in Europe because of atheism. In fact, Hitler doesn't even appear to have been an atheist. He, he, regularly invoked Jesus in his speeches. But that's beside the point. He did it on the basis of other beliefs, dogmas about Jews and, and the, the purity of German blood. The history of Muslim jihad, however, does have something to do with Islam. The atrocities of September 11th did have something to do with what 19 men believed about martyrdom and paradise. The fact that we're not funding stem cell research at the federal level does have something to do with what Christians believe about conception and the human soul. It's important to focus on the specific consequences of specific ideas. So I want, I want to make it very clear that I am not holding religion responsible for every bad thing that a religious person has done in human history, to be balanced against all the bad things that, that atheists have done. I'm only holding religion responsible for what people do and will continue to do explicitly for religious reasons. So I submit to you that there, there really is no society in human history that has ever suffered because its population became too reasonable, too reluctant to embrace dogma, or too demanding of evidence. So in conclusion, let me say that I, I think Civilization in the 21st century is, is passing through a bottleneck of sorts, formed on the one side by 21st century destructive technology and on the other by, by Iron Age superstition. And we will either pass through this bottleneck, more or less intact, more or less painfully, or we'll destroy ourselves. Now perhaps this fear sounds grandiose to some of you, but the truth is that civilizations can end. In fact, every civilization in human history virtually has ended. Over and over again in history, some unlucky generation has had to witness the ruination of everything they and their ancestors had worked hard to build. We are a part of history. There is, there is no guarantee that things can't go spectacularly wrong for us. In fact, it's an article of faith in many religious communi communities that things will go spectacularly wrong and that this is a good thing. Seventy-nine percent of Americans think that Jesus is going to come down out of the clouds and rectify all of our problems with his magic powers at some point in history. Twenty percent of Americans claim to be certain that it will happen in their lifetime. This is precisely the sort of thinking we do not need. And I think it should be rather obvious that prophecies about the end of the world could well be self-fulfilling. So in the uniqueness of our circumstance with respect to the growth of technology, I think also shouldn't be ignored. I mean, not only is technology growing, but the rate at which technology is growing is also growing. I mean, futurists like Ray Kurzweil have, have said that the rate is doubling every 10 years. So that if you look at the rate at which technology was growing in uh, the year 2000 as your metric, 
the 20th century represents something like 20 years of change. Now we're in the process of, of making another 20 years of, of change in about 14 years and then seven and then three and a half. If this trend continues, the 21st century won't represent a hundred years of technological change, but 20,000 years. I mean, 20,000 years ago, human beings exactly like ourselves with the same size brains, the same biological capacity for creative thought, had been languishing for at least 100,000 years and had produced nothing more complicated than a bow and arrow. We went from a bow and arrow to the internet in 20,000 years. Imagine seeing this much change in a single century. And let's be utterly, utterly conservative. Let's just say we're going to have as much change in this century as we did last century. Even this is sobering when you, when you recognize who is going to have access to this kind of technology. I mean, just, just look at how the internet has facilitated the global jihadist movement among Muslims. Look how difficult it is proving to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. So I think if we accept that the, I think, quite reasonable premise that it's going to remain easier to break things than to fix them or defend them, the growth of technology is, is, is quite sobering in the way that it is interacting with religion, especially in a world that has been shattered into competing religious and moral communities, and especially among communities who think death is an illusion that this world is, is fit only to be consumed by God's fury, and that the destruction of every tangible good will itself be the highest good because it will be a gateway to eternity. These are explicitly religious ideas. They have no basis in fact, and yet they are amazingly well subscribed. It seems to me that it is everyone's responsibility to help break this spell. Thank you very much. Oh, hello. Um, in your arguments, you use mostly reason and the brain to argue against religion and the Bible. The ancient philosopher um, Blaise Pascal wrote in his Pensees, mm. the heart has reason in which reason does not know. We know this in countless ways. What would you say to people who try to lead a good and just life by, um, through their religion and by following what is in their hearts rather than following the literal sayings of the Bible and following reasoning? Yeah, well, I certainly don't mean to diminish experience that, that has nothing to do with coming to a rational understanding of the way the world works. I mean, it's, much of our experience is not a matter of reason. It's not a matter of, of belief even. And, I, and, and some of the most important aspects of our experience aren't. So experiencing love and devotion and awe, I mean, these, these are, are features of our subjectivity that I think are extraordinarily valuable. The important thing to recognize is that if you think the only real container, the only viable container for those experiences is your denominational church, is, your, is, is, the, is the, the language of your ancestors, you know, if, you're, if you're still committed to being a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, I think you are tacitly um, supporting the religious divisions in our world. I mean, you are, you are giving cover, I think quite explicitly, to all of the people who take their holy books far more seriously. I mean, I can't tell you how much time I and other people have spent having to fight the battle against the liberals and moderate Christians and Jews and Muslims who will, who will insist upon the viability of, of these denominations and of raising their children to, to, be, to think that they're Christians and Muslims and Jews and will, who will never admit that any of the, the extremist behavior going on in the name of their faith has anything to do with religion. And so it, 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 there's no question in my mind that it provides a kind of friction uh, in, our, in our discourse where we really can't call a spade a spade and say, okay, this is much, much of the Bible and the Quran is just life-destroying gibberish and we just have to acknowledge this and, and cease to take these books seriously. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. 
First Hi. of all, I loved uh, your first book. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Oh, and thank I'm you. Stunned at how young you are, because don't be stunned. I'm not that young. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in learning, I mean, I thank you so much for taking the time to study um, Western and Eastern religions for decades. That's why I thought you were older. Uh -huh. um, and I haven't read the second book yet, I apologize. But my question has to do more with where our beliefs come from. We know there's a lot of peer pressure in our cultural to be religious, to have a belief in God, mm -hmm. and to be a part of some organized religion. And I have tried my whole life to be a part of that in terms of I've tried three different religions I've converted twice and that thing doesn't work for me the God thing does not work for me and I've always felt very um, unhappy about it that it was a lack somehow in my character but then I've read recently that there's a study that has been done and I'm wondering if maybe this is why you're studying neuroscience there's a study that has been done that posits there may be a belief gene, there may be a gene in people that makes them believers, and those of us who don't have it, we don't have it. Right, right. Well, I think you might be referring to Dean Hamer's uh, much publicized notion of the God gene, which, yes. uh, if I'm not mistaken, related to a, a serotonin receptor or transporter that people have in abundance if they have these, tend to have these transcendent experiences. So it didn't deal with belief per se. I think that the issue of belief is that um, I, don't, I don't see religious belief as distinct from any other kinds of beliefs. I mean, we, we represent the world in our thoughts, and all of us are in the business of hoping that our, that our represent, representations are accurate, or at least accurate enough so that we can successfully negotiate our lives happily. I mean, nobody wants to be mistaken, profoundly mistaken, about their place in the world, or about what, you know, what happens after death, or uh, where their where their loved ones go after I me. Mean, we're, we're not in the business of deceiving ourselves just willfully, um, and so religious beliefs are on all fours with all of our other beliefs. We are describing the world. We're trading in these in these descriptions through language. Someone says to you, "Well, do you realize that Jesus is your personal savior, and and you know nobody, you know He's the way and the truth and the life, and nobody gets to heaven but through Him?" That is a that is a, a description of the way this universe is organized in moral terms and in, in spiritual terms, and it's either right or wrong, and it purports to be right, uh, and it, it, it offers, it promises terrible consequences who tho to, to those who don't accept it. Um, now, this is a very strange scheme, I think, to believe in. I mean, I don't, I'm not the first person to, to point out that it's a very strange sort of loving God who would, who would have salvation depend on a person's ability to believe in him for bad reasons. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it just, it's, a, it's a weird scenario, but it's a scenario that is, is many people find emotionally consoling. And, and this, another aspect here is that reason and belief are, are not easily separated from emotion. I mean, we, our, emotion, our, our rational lives are deeply entangled with our emotional lives, and we feel emotional responses to things we find to be unreasonable. I mean, I, you know, I happen to think that, that doubt is, a, is on the continuum with disgust and other psychological rejection states. And so when we doubt a proposition, we are having an emotional response to it. And so I, I, th I think we, um, you know, we, we just have to be, I think there's, a, there's an all-purpose corrective here, which is just intellectual honesty. I mean, if you cease to pretend to be certain about things you're not certain about, see where that gets you. See where that gets you in conversation with other human beings. I think it'll get you a profoundly ethical life. It'll, it'll certainly get you a profoundly non-deceptive life. Uh, Which leads me to one other quick follow-up question. Yeah. When you say um, being intellectually honest and admitting you don't know these things, mm -hmm. you said there were three ways to look at religion. One, that it's true. Second, that it's useful. useful yeah. And third, that you're an atheist and that is a religion. But there's a fourth thing, and that could be that you're an agnostic. You don't know whether it's true yeah, or not. Yeah, but I, I don't meet too many agnostics about Zeus. <laughs> you know, all these agnostics about the God of Abraham should also be agnostic about Zeus. I mean, that's okay. the same scenario. Thank you. Hi, Hi. Uh, Angela Caldwell. Uh, the physics professor, Mr. Kraus, just spoke to the Bezos scholars. Mm -hmm. One of the things he said, well, actually, before I say that, I'd like to say about your uh, comment on the biblical creation of women, that's only because creators have to make a rough draft before they get it right. <laughs> um, I stand corrected. 
Uh, but Mr. Krauss was saying uh, in uh, discussion of Galileo's theor theory of relativity mm -hmm. and Einstein's discovery of the electromagnetism, such and such, um, was that they're both right, but they're not necessarily consistent. And I right. was wondering what your opinion on that sort of view is for evolution versus creationism. Well, this, is, this gets us, I think, somewhat too far afield into questions of epistemology and the philosophy of science. I, there, there are real problems in trying to make the claim that, that our beliefs about the world represent reality as it is. You know, that, you can, that, you're, that our beliefs can ever be perfectly true. And there's, and there's a, you know, much evidence in science that we get these approximations which are incredibly useful uh, as guides to reality. And then they become overturned by other approximations that actually don't look much like the, pro the approximations they're overturning. So, you know, relativity, Einsteinian relativity, did not look much like Newton's physics. Um, and yet, they both work in, within certain limits. Um, so the question is, what is, what is the, the relationship between reality and our thoughts? Um, all of this is, gets very interesting and nuanced and is perfectly legitimate to, to debate at the at the fringe of, of science and it, you know, theoretical physics, certainly. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it really doesn't apply to our, our commonsensical human experience in the same way. I mean, we can, it's clear you can be right or wrong about a variety of propositions by which you would want to live your life. And you can believe things for, for good or bad reasons. For, you, you can have justified or unjustified beliefs. And we all recognize a degree of, of intellectual honesty and rigor here. I mean, if somebody tells you that your boyfriend is cheating on you, you're going to want evidence. And, and you're going to be convinced to the degree that they provide evidence. Now, if they provide, you know, if they dump out all the pictures on the tabletop and say, here he is, caught in the act, then you will, that's one experience. If they just say, well, I saw it in a dream, uh, <laughs> you're not going to be so interested. And there's a, there's a continuum there. And there, there are these the probabilistic uh, ascriptions of certainty. We're, we're, we're very rarely totally certain about anything, and yet we have degrees of confidence that we can all talk intelligently about. And anyone who is who's, who's certain that the Bible was dictated by the creator of the universe, or that is certain that Jesus was born of a virgin, or certain that you get 72 virgins in paradise if you die in defense of Islam, these are these are virtually baseless certainties, and we can know that if we just speak honestly about the, these ideas. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Harris. Yeah, oh. and I, again, Hello. I don't know, I'm not keeping time very well here, so if someone's going to get a hook, okay, you're... Uh, I'm Ben Altman, an Abizo scholar. You uh -huh. said that in religion, woman was created from man's rib, especially in the Old Testament. Uh-huh. In Genesis, there are two stories of, of yeah. creation. There's also a story that goes, God created man, male and female, he created them. That's true. In Judaism, the interpretation is such that man and woman, the, the conventional one is such that man and woman were created back to back as one single unit, and then God cleaved them in half. And from that interpretation, there comes a lot of discussion about how man and woman interplay off of each other and grow together, and right. that they take different areas because of the type of person that man and woman is. What is your response to the evolution of religions such that just the way a science evol has evolved over time and that it starts to include more as it learns more and understands more about people? Right, right. And well, well the text is just a basis for something that's evolved over yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we should be, the first thing I would say is that by my lights, they are not and cannot and will not evolve quickly enough. I mean, this is the, uh, we just don't have that much time to wait around for people to dicker with their religious certainties. Um, at least that's my view. But the other thing is that we have to be honest about why they are evolving. The, the, the door leading out of religious literalism doesn't open from the inside. I mean, these, these religions have been moderated because of, because of the pressure of modernity. I mean, it's secular politics and a, and a conception of human rights and our, our growing scientific understanding of the universe has applied pressure much more so in the, in the case of Judaism and Christianity than it has in Islam, because Islam has been isolated from the Enlightenment and you know, even the Renaissance in some significant sense. Um, and so this, this comes from outside. So this is not to be credited to faith. This is, this is the legacy of faith continually losing the argument to science 
and secular politics and common sense. This is why we are not stoning people to death for adultery in Aspen. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing we're not, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. just wait, it's possible. Uh, but it, so, so you're, are you going to credit the Catholic Church that did not absolve Galileo of heresy until 1992? I mean, it's, it's, this, is, this, is a, this organization is very slow to move. And, and I, I think at some point, it would take something like their prescription against contraception use. I mean, this is, this is flagrantly immoral, getting people killed throughout the developing world. I mean, this is ministers go into villages riddled with AIDS and preach the sinfulness of condom use. Okay, shockingly immoral behavior, mandated by their religious faith. I, I certainly hope to, to live to see the day where the Vatican recants this dogma, and they say, you know, this was a mistake, condoms are, are blameless, that'll be a good thing. Who's going to get the credit? The Vatican, when that happens? Um, this is, this, this is a, a, a dinosaur of an organization that has really been slow to make the, mo the simplest accommod accommodations to basic human sanity. So that's, that's the other point I would make, is that we have to be honest about where the change is coming from. And the other, uh, now that I'm on the subject, the other point I would make is that our attachment to these traditions essentially sends the message that, that it's impossible to speak about spirituality and ethics in a truly new, fresh, modern, rational, non-dogmatic, non-divisive way. That we have to stay linked to these traditions. I, I don't see any evidence for that, and, and we don't play by those rules in any other domain, certainly not in science. But then how would you respond to the Sai Gong and Rabbi Kulo sitting down last night at an evening exchange and talking openly about religions and, and, and comparing the ways they both work? Well, th that, that is the discourse of religious moderation. It's true that you can put moderate Christians and moderate Muslims and moderate Jews on the same dais and they may, pr you know, they may, I think we, we should look closely at who's calling themselves a moderate and what they really believe. I think there are many people who pretend to more moderation than they do, in fact, uh, embody. I think there are people who are sitting on the same dais in a very friendly way, in a collegial way, talking about the, the common project of religious diversity, all the while thinking that their colleagues are going to go to hell for eternity. <laughs> I think people are finding them in that, themselves in that situation a lot and not admitting it. But uh, as I, you know, I sat down with Rick Warren, who is criticized from the religious right. I mean, he's, I wouldn't call him a moderate. He's still a fundamentalist of sorts. But there are people much more fundamental than he who criticize him for not being biblical enough. You know, in John Meacham asked him in the interview, do you think Sam is going to go to hell? Well, yeah, probably. Um, so it's, it's, and yet we had a perfectly uh, congenial conversation. It was, you know, we, we could collaborate on a common project to help people. There's no, there's no barrier to that. But this is to be ascribed to basic human decency and a larger purview of ethics and, and intuitions about how we want to collaborate with one another. One more so, thank you. Yeah. Um, one, one more question. I'm Becca Bass, and I'm also a Bezos scholar. Uh -huh. And I'm not a religious person, and I don't know what I believe yet. But I was wondering if you had ever struggled with finding a balance between the logic, intellectualism, and what I think is kind of an innate human need for something more, something less rational. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, I, mean, I don't think I am a a particularly good advertisement for achieving that balance, but uh, within within the privacy of my own mind, I do you know work to find that balance. And I and you know so I, I, I've spent months on meditation retreats, you know, just doing nothing but practice meditation in silence. And this this is not a matter of of thinking or or you know, you, you you inadvertently think, but the, the goal the goal of meditation is not to think about anything rationally or figure anything out. It, it is simply to pay more and more attention to the flow of your experience and see what it's like to be just aware of sights and sounds and sensations. This is a highly non-rational pursuit. It's not an irrational pursuit. I mean, it be only becomes irrational if you begin making claims about the universe that are not rationally justifiable. But it is, you know, it's an occasion in which you, know, you experience bliss and, and a variety of things that spiritual people desperately want to experience. Um, 
you don't have to pretend to know anything you don't know in order to do that. And that's, that's really my basic point. Thank you very much. Thank you.